Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So first of all, welcome. I'm Anna Pinedo, a partner in the New York office of Mayor Brown. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us this evening, and thanks to all of you who are joining us by Zoom um, for our discussion tonight. Um, and I'm going to introduce our, our speakers. So to my left, we're delighted to have Bill Cohen with us. And uh, Bill is a former M&A banker, but um, he is probably best known as a best-selling author. And um, we can probably string cite all of his best-selling books, but most recently in the book that we are, uh, that some of us are going to walk away with this evening, Power Failure, um, about um, GE, is a, a phenomenal read. Um, and uh, he's also a contributing um, writer and editor. Uh, to Vanity Fair, the Financial Times, and um, the uh, and Puck, which I am a devoted reader of, um, and of course um, Larry Cunningham, a uh, special counsel here in our New York office and a uh, well-recognized expert in uh, all things related to corporate governance. Larry um, joined us in January, and uh, if you haven't had a chance to. Uh, get to know Larry. Hopefully you will do so soon. Um, Larry um, taught for many, many years at George Washington uh, Law School and uh, writes at, very broadly on um, all things related to corporate governance as well as um, ESG. And so our topic for uh, today's discussion is ESG and corporate governance. And we're going to start with a little level setting. Um, and Larry is going to start out by um, talking a little bit about how we got to where we are. That's fair to say if we know where we are, Larry. Um, but at least um, set, the, set the stage for us before we get into a little bit of a debate. Yes, indeed. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Anna, very much for hosting this gathering. And thank you to Bill for participating with us. I just want to provide some backstory. And uh, I've got some slides to share here in the room and with you on Zoom. The backstory that I think frames uh, this discussion might be called the rise and stall of ESG. We are at a crossroads. The, the rise has been tremendous, and I'll just go through seven highlights of that rise, starting with the United Nations and continuing through the ecosystem that is now a super powerful, self-sustaining force behind ESG. And then I'll highlight seven of the factors that have caused it some trouble or the movement some resistance. Um, and uh, going from academic literature to journalistic uh, critiques. So the backstory starts uh, around 2005 or so when the United Nations announced a set of investment and management principles that were extremely well intended, that congregated around some of the most compelling aspirations of human civilization, including to end hunger, to end poverty, to end war. And it advocated to animate all investing and management with this abiding principle of sustainability. They had a very specific definition of that word, which is faded from common usage or memory, but it's the idea that we should live well, but never at the price of future generations living as well. That's the uh, animating thesis, and it's extremely difficult to challenge uh, those aspirations. And soon enough, this set of ideas coalesced around E, S, and G. Again, some unassailable virtues delineated under each heading from in the environmental sector, protecting the climate to preserving water, in the social sector, from catering to customers to protecting the workforce, in G, trying to have leadership that will advance these goals and to protect anybody in the organization who complains that people are violating them. The, the UN wanted to operationalize these principles on the management side, 
Many large companies did so. Here's an example of a large international restaurant chain's ambitions. On E, everything from sustainable farming to more recycling of the packaging. On S, training the workforce better and assuring worker safety. On G, having a committee charged with overseeing these goals, having a officer as the chief of sustainability. The investment community adopted a variety of strategies to implement these ideas, some quite closely connected with traditional investing that thought if you use these tools, you will be able to do well by doing good. Others took a, a little different approach and worried as much about the social impact as the financial returns, and yet others went even further and simply excluded certain businesses from any portfolio, businesses from guns, tobacco, alcohol, gaming, to fossil fuels. Now, as these forces began to proliferate, a bunch of tailwinds entered and supported the phenomenon, the movement, starting with the wonderful vocabulary. It's sustainability is a very attractive concept, as are related concepts of accountability uh, and so on. Uh, the asset managers became quite attracted to ESG because it became a, a way for them to compete, especially important for index funds where they couldn't compete on returns because they buy the entire portfolio and they barely could compete on price because there are very few costs. So this was very attractive to that cohort. The movement intensified beginning around 2019 with uh, the, the rising power of social sub movements like me Too and Black Lives Matter, which had enormous force and found attractive a lot of what the S in ESG promised. And finally, there was measurable erosion of trust in governments that led people to look to corporations in the private sector to solve social problems. And finally, amid this was the proliferation of millions of people who make a living, some a quite substantial living from ESG, starting with the standard setters, the uh, data providers, large coalitions of organizations all around the world, professional services firms, money managers for sure, and armies of uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations. But, so that's the, that's the rise of late. Some politics have entered. Uh, there have been some criticisms or debates around what looked to be ESG mandates uh, or priorities and some of the messaging that has created some collisions there. These include fights about whether society's problems are better solved with spontaneous coordination that you see in markets or coordinated mandates such as you see through this sort of community. Uh, when ESG prioritizes S especially, um, there's a question about whether corporate governance needs to change, whether the old shareholder primacy model needs to adapt. That reinvigorates a long-standing and intense debate. Some ESG critiques uh, challenge the legitimacy or validity of capitalism, which leads proponents of capitalism to feel threatened. The additional seeds of doubt uh, have, been, have been planted. Uh, there's some evidence, growing evidence that people uh, miscreants uh, abuse the whole movement. So we have greenwashing, fictitious obedience to E, uh, pinkwashing, faking the social aspects. Um, there's increasing doubt about whether ESG really does advance the economic as well as the other agendas. There's criticism about money managers prioritizing their own interests rather than client interests. And just to highlight a few of those, the Empirical academic research is increasingly discovering that sustainable funds do not outperform uh, traditional uh, funds. Another study shows that people like the idea of sustainability. They like to invest in sustainable funds, but high sustainable funds don't outperform low sustainable funds. There's growing evidence of greenwashing in the academic research, showing that firms that sign on to the UN's principles actually have some of the lowest ESG scores. Um, another showed that funds that call themselves ESG actually have the worst, are investing in companies with the worst records on these topics. And 
lo and behold, there's evidence showing that managers who run companies that are struggling economically talk more about ESG in their quarterly reports than the average company. Um, surveys of individual investors increasingly indicate declining enthusiasm for ESG. Most prioritize economic returns over elements of E, S, or G. One notable finding is that richer investors are more willing to trade off financial returns for those other benefits than ordinary people. Very interesting. Um, the fund flows confirm the survey data. This is probably the most important slide in the deck. It depicts, this is a Morningstar data. Just, uh, the graph is right out of Morningstar, showing the investment of capital by ordinary investors in mutual funds that are sustainable in some way or another. And you see it rising right at the dawn of the pandemic, peaking one year later, and then reversing one year after that. This is a stunning thing. The fourth quarter of last year, so the most recent data shows for the first time in nine quarters, the net outflow of funds from sustainable investing. Uh, and of course, the, the political and legal scrutiny is, is increasing across the board. There are regulatory actions against global banks and asset managers for false claims about sustainability. Uh, there are complaints that asset managers are prioritizing their own views over those of their clients. Many reform suggestions have been made in this area, including legislation that would require the index funds to pass through the voting rights. Um, the political divide there on the right side is evident, palpable. I think you read about it every day. Uh, Republican-led states are enacting legislation and regulations that ban reference to ESG, while Democratic-led states do the opposite. At the federal level, you see the acute polar, uh, politicization, the Trump administration's DOL, the Department of Labor, and SEC were fans or foes of ESG or skeptics. The Biden administration counterparts are fans, and so you see this regulatory flip-flop. Uh, there is uh, evidence of stress among the leading coalitions. U.S. banks are starting to find that some of the U.N. regulations or, or expectations of members are a little tougher for them to take than they expected. Uh, you see fragmentation uh, among the activists. If you look at the shareholder proposal process where a lot of this stuff has been playing out, you see um, a rising number of anti-ESG proposals, conservative proposals, if you like, and on the progressive side, a lot more coordination. So there's just an intense uh, fight uh, brewing uh, going on. Uh, you see it even among proponents of ESG. You find a lot of the index funds are softening their support of climate proposals, while um, zealous advocates are seeking to, uh, in effect, end the fossil fuel industry. Um, proposals on the corporate ballots these days are um, every topic imaginable that is combustible in this civilization. Most recently, abortion is now part of the corporate uh, ballot, suggesting that the, the fault lines are are deepening and, 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 and probably uh, uh, they're unsustainable. Uh, and then intellectually, another source of resisting is, is, is increasing perception of a top-down, one-size-fits-all um, leadership in, in ESG forces. Uh, for example, the index funds publish annual rules on governance that dictate dozens of specific features every company has to have, which is um, you know, contrary to traditional corporate governance that wants companies to be able to tailor the choices to meet their needs. Um, there's a sense of the top-down one-size-fits-all in E uh, and S as well, uh, again, coming from the indexers who seem to um, believe they have all of the right answers and that there can be no doubt about their views, uh, which I think um, just it is probably not the savviest approach to sustain a movement. Um, the last one there on the picture is where one of the funds told every CEO in the country that that company, that CEO has to speak out on every social issue. Um, that was a two, two years ago. The Disney people would, would probably recognize that as a mistake. It's more sensible to take a contextual approach to whether a company should speak out um, uh, with director and boards and Mayor Brown, I published this suggestion just as a framework for thinking about it, intended just to illustrate that there is no one size fits all, that this is a tough topic that will vary with the subject matter, the personalities involved, 
and the relation between the, the social issue and the company. So I think for all of these reasons, you're starting to see uh, bad press. Uh, you know, for, for most of its early years, especially in its aspirational phases, um, most, most press coverage was, um, if not fawning, then enthusiastic or open. Uh, uh, but the, these days, um, e even in progressive papers or left-wing uh, views, there's, there's a greater degree of, of skepticism and, and an effort to seek more balance. Uh, and certainly we at, uh, at Mayor Brown are contributing to this course, as, uh, as Anna said, in your packets, you'll find a um, listing of some of the articles we've posted um, on on uh, across the board, which is our, our website for corporate governance topics. So that, that's intended to set the table. Arise, and that's certainly not fallen. It's still enormously powerful. But there, there are fissures, there are tensions, uh, and I think we're at a crossroads. And it's it's worthwhile, I think, the mid at that moment to have uh, gatherings like this and sort of take stock of uh, where we are, where we might go. So, thank you very much for listening and for attending. So, with that, um, I'm just going to bring Bill into the discussion a little bit. And Bill, maybe a good place to start is with some of the institutional. Um, the large institutional holders and their perceptions of, and I should say, by the way, that all of the views that we're expressing are personal views, not necessarily the views of the firm. And, and that's especially, obviously, uh, the case for Bill. Um, and we should feel free, and you should feel free to interject. I'm sure um, we'd all appreciate questions as we go through. And um, we'll have somebody monitor for, for questions on Melissa. We'll, we'll just interject if there are questions in the chat. Um, and we'll take questions from folks who are listening by Zoom so that we try and make it somewhat interactive. Um, but going back to my, my point, maybe we'll start um, where Larry kind of ended with some of the institutional holders. Um, and they're expressing views. And I think um, you may have titled one of your, your puck pieces, something like woke capitalism, um, which itself is a title, it says quite a lot. Um, so I'll let you, I'll let you share yeah, um, well, some perspectives. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Larry. It's nice to be here. Sorry, my back is so uh, to be termed to, to all of you, but not, not in spirit. And, uh, and definitely to reiterate your point, Anna, that um, obviously these are my views and not uh, Mayor Brown views. Uh, so uh, I was talking for that piece to Curtis Loftus, who's the state treasurer of the state of South Carolina, and I think the longest serving uh, state treasurer in the country. And it's uh, an elected position, so he's must be doing something right because he keeps getting elected. Uh, he was not the least bit shy, uh, Larry, you'll be glad to know, uh, in telling me basically how much he hates ESG, uh, the movement, uh, what it stands for, and the implications for somebody like him as a state treasurer. And I think they have like 60 billion or so dollars for which he's a fiduciary for the people of South Carolina. Uh, and he was very clear with me in many different ways and, and completely on the record, which is always refreshing, that uh, he does not like it, does not uh, like to be told uh, where he can and cannot invest uh, his state's money. And actually um, uh, decided after our friend Larry Fink uh, uh, you know, has made such a big deal about ESG and well, he sort of also talks a little bit out of both sides of his mouth about it because he uh, is a huge proponent of ESG, but also wants people to know that he, uh, BlackRock is investing in fossil fuel uh, uh, stock equities and other things that might not be consistent with ESG. So, uh, but he, you know, again, he also made clear that the outflows from state treasurer, so-called red state treasurers uh, like uh, Curtis Loftus um, are minor compared to the inflows. So yes, he's aware definitely that Curtis 
uh, among other state treasurers, have pulled their funds from uh, BlackRock. At the same time, he's more than happy to tell you that something like seven times more money has come in from people who want him to invest, uh, you know, with an ESG outlook. So um, I was really just struck uh, by how uh, serious and emphatic uh, somebody like Curtis Loftus was about how much they hate uh, ESG and being told what to do and that they uh, have uh, pulled their money out of money managers uh, who uh, espouse ESG investing, uh, which, again, I was a little bit surprised by how uh, emphatic it's all become and the, the, the lines have been drawn in the sand. Um, and I think, you know, as someone who has uh, long admired uh, Warren Buffett for his investing prowess, I mean, there's really no debating what a great investor he is and how much we all sort of regard his investing skills. I mean, he, he clearly, uh, I guess when he's 92 or however old he is, he doesn't uh, uh, care much about ESG investing. He continues to add to his position in Occidental Petroleum sort of day after day, week after week. Uh, I think he also owns a big stake in Chevron. So um, I find it, um, you know, it, it's, it's more political than I would have expected. And their fault lines are clear. And uh, I think, you know, some people uh, don't like to be told what to do. Uh, and don't like to be feel like they have to do uh, something that others are encouraging them to do or making a big deal about. Uh, and, you know, I, I think I can see, it's interesting, I can see both both sides of this. Uh, so, so, Larry, and so I guess before we get into Buffett, because that can, that can take us on, uh, on a tangent, maybe... Um, in, in following this sort of public monies and, and um, institutional investor angle, um, you've talked quite a bit uh, about um, indexers and institutional investors expressing their particular um, preferences um, and we're, we're right now um, just in the midst of proxy season and you pointed out um, the proxy proposals and it's been already quite a contentious proxy season um, to the point that <coughs> Bill made um, regarding uh, how strident some of the dialogue has um, become. Do you see any um, change in light of some of these um, trends with, with how monies are um, being invested or, or the way that money, the outflows of money? Yeah, I mean, the, the net um, state money that, that Bill referred to reflects the, the red-blue divide that, that uh, was on that map. And it just happens there's more money in those bigger states. And so that, that's the net of it. Um, the Morningstar picture that I showed is just of individuals. And I think ultimately that's whose views are need to matter. So the institutions... Um, have traditionally voted their, their assets under management uh, according to their own sense of what is the best thing for their clients. And I think uh, there's a lot of criticism about whether they're, whether they're doing that faithfully. And, uh, and the industry is responding. Um, BlackRock is trying to develop the technologies that would enable them to pass the vote through. Uh, it will take a long time, but they're trying. Uh, there's certainly... Uh, political movements in that direction. There are bills circulating in Congress that would require versions of this. Uh, and so I think that that message is is, is going to, to to register. I don't it may not show up in this season's uh, voting, but but it might a little. I think people are going to appreciate that as as attractive as the corporation is as a vehicle for significant social change, some of these debates are best settled outside of the of the corporate frame. And, and I think we'll have to learn that lesson. Uh, it may take a while, um, but uh, uh, part of it is the, 
a, a, a point I didn't, didn't make earlier was the change that the SEC staff and leadership signaled a year or two ago, I think it was a year, last year, that under the shareholder proposal rule, traditionally a corporation would be entitled to exclude a shareholder proposal if it didn't uh, raise issues of, of a social nature that related some way to the corporation. And, and the staff indicated that it would no longer permit corporations to do that, but that if the, they just focus on if the issue raised a significant policy, or social issue. Um, and, and so you're, you've got four or five you know, proposals about what, what is this company doing to protect employees' rights to um, uh, 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 reproductive care, abortions. Maybe, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe we should have that debate at American Express. But I, I think we're going to find that it's just going to cause uh, those, those fights ought to be held outside of the boardroom, uh, I, I think. So, uh, uh, and I think you're starting to see um, some pushback of that sort. And I think there's the, the combustion may, may lead a lot of people to think, you know, it's, it's better uh, for uh, the system to have economics, politics, society, and and so, you know, they overlap, obviously, but to segregate them in some ways. And, and I mean, I think the point about Buffett is that's what he's always done. Uh, uh, he has kept out of politics anytime he ventured in there. He got his, uh, his you know, his, his company's neck cut off, uh, including around the abortion issue. And, and so he cares deeply about all the elements, all those aspirational elements. I mean, I've got, you know, a book of his letters and I've got categories. We've been publishing this book for 30 years. Categories that look a lot like the E category, the S category, the G category, but we never called them that. And you didn't really need to. Um, and so I think um, the, the, the issues are, are real, lively, and relevant, but we, they've become, become politicized and, and a little toxic. And, and I, we need, my own view is it would be desirable for us to figure out a way to <laughs> um, remediate that and, and come back to a more civic uh, discussion of, of these topics. Okay. Um, so. I'm oh, sorry, you have a question. question. Yeah. You talked about the performance of ESG fund versus non ESG fund. You said they were not outperforming, I believe, versus both conventional non ESG funds. Are they performing necessarily any worse? Or how do you think, are they just sort of on pair? So if somebody wants to be in an ESG, I'm not going to be sacrificing return versus that, that doesn't care. Yeah. yeah the, the main study that, that I'd suggest we, we take a look at for that is a meta study. Uh, so that means it, it looked at the 1,400 other empirical studies probing the relative performance of an, a sustainable fund versus others. And with any statistical empirical examination like that, you've got a lot of different outcomes, a lot of different assumptions, data, parameters, limitations, and so on. So you, you sift through all that stuff. And what this research, this meta research found was that two thirds of the studies indicated no or underperformance no outperformance or underperformance by the ESG or sustainable funds. And a third of them did. So, okay, it so this is not uh, science, right? Social science. And so we, it may be, it may be possible, especially if you've got a lot of conviction around it, for you to find that Ben Franklin beauty where you do well by doing good. And they're probably out there. But the, uh, the, you know, the, the point of, I think, this research, this meta research is, let's not get carried away. <laughs> there was an exuberance at certain points in this in this debate where this is obvious. It's obvious that if you you know take that sustainability view, you will produce better returns. And what the data is showing is that that's not really that's not so. <laughs> so be much be much more nuanced and, and careful about it. So you know, I guess bottom line, you're not penalized. So you know, I guess where I come down on this would be is I'm not being financially penalized. If I want to go eat, I'm okay. I, don't want to go I, I would just say that there are a million different studies that cut the data in a number of different ways. And you can use the statistics essentially and the studies to come out and to justify almost any conclusion in that respect. And if we were to pull, and I've pulled for different presentations, the studies, and we have clients that can pull the studies on on and you can pull it very finely depending on what category and for you know fixed income versus or whatever type and you'll come out with a different conclusion so it's i think it's it's even still very subjective even with statistics so maybe we'll we'll just leave it at that i would just add that if you know you weren't investing 
in Exxon Mobil in the last couple of years, you probably lost a lot of return. You may be okay with that, but uh, there was clearly a lot of money made in that particular company and the whole energy sector in the last few years. So Bill, did you hear from any of the um, institutional investors in reaction to your piece or generally, obviously this is a community that you spent quite a bit of time with on, on all of the, the coverage that you, on all of your coverage. So any reactions? You know, it was, um, you know, surprisingly uh, muted, frankly. Uh, I thought, uh, frankly, that, you know, what Curtis was saying would make people a little nuts uh, because he was so strident about his views and literally pulling money out of BlackRock and directing it to Franklin or, you know, uh, Federated uh, because they were uh, more attuned to what he wanted them to do. Um, but uh, so I was, I was thinking that because of the language he used uh, and how firmly he felt about it and the fact that he was the longest serving treasurer and was on the record about it, that I would uh, be hearing a lot. But I, I didn't hear much and that surprised me, um, which I gather means that um, he speaks for a large part of uh, the investing population that uh, doesn't really want to be to told what to do or how to how to go about their jobs as fiduciaries. That that's the most important thing. I, I'm a fiduciary. I'm a sworn fiduciary. I'm an elected fiduciary. I've got sixty or seventy or a hundred billion dollars to manage, and I'm going to manage it the way I or have hire managers to manage it the way I feel I should, or that I feel that my constituents want me to. And, and I think both sides, and Larry would know this better than I, are pretty dug in at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, again, uh, Larry Fink was you know, basically pretty dismissive uh, of the uh, renegades like uh, Curtis as like, okay, you know, fine, it's not going to hurt my business. I'm doing great. And the preponderance of people that I deal with at BlackRock want me to do this. So I'm going to continue to do this. But oh, by the way, I also uh, invest in fossil fuel companies, just so you know. You know I'm, not, I'm not completely abandoning it. So um, it just strikes me as stalled. Okay. And so let's, let's um, turn our attention now maybe to um, to directors and and to the boardroom. So this is something, Larry, that, that you've touched on in, in your presentation in, in talking a little bit about corporate purpose and um, whether um, thinking about all of these things, whether it's commenting on societal issues or um, more generally on uh, thinking about ESG, um, it aligns with particular companies' um, profit-making purpose. <coughs> Bill, is that something that in all of your delving into, um, because you really have um, almost forensically analyzed a number of companies um, in, in times of crisis um, and um, and uh, talked to to CEOs and CFOs and directors. Um, what is your particular view on you know, kind of uh, corporate purpose and and whether these discussions, whether it's um, the S part or, or the E part, whether those are, are valid concerns or they belong in the boardroom, they don't belong in the boardroom, whether it's the shareholder that should say whether there are concerns that ought to be in the boardroom? I think like, uh, that's a, that's a, that's, those are big questions. Uh, I think like so much of our lives today, these questions are very complex and complicated and there's not 
one easy answer. So on the, on the first uh, answer, it, it depends what kind of company you are, right? I mean, if, uh, say, you're uh, Patagonia, uh, which is dedicated to ESG issues, and it's like its whole being is that, and, it, you know, the, the, the founder just conveyed the company, uh, you know, never took the company public, kept it private, and just conveyed it to a, to a foundation, I believe, uh, so that it will uh, maintain these, you know, ESG matters in perpetuity. Uh, to you know, Exxon Mobil. What's what's Exxon? What what could they possibly be talking about in that boardroom other than uh, you know we're going to continue doing what we're doing, which is you know providing. Uh, uh, refined petroleum products to people all over the world who want them. You know, uh, uh, th there's a reason uh, ExxonMobil uh, uh, made so much money last year. I mean, uh, people still want their products. People, yes, we are slowly converting to uh, electric vehicles, but as my friend Dan Jurgen has told me, you know, even if everybody went to electric vehicles, it's still a very small percentage of the overall use of energy uh, products. Uh, and it won't really change the use of petroleum products. Uh, you know, until, and by the way, to create electricity uh, requires a lot of petroleum and fossil fuel products. People forget that about uh, electric vehicles and and other electric appliances. I mean, we can all go electric, but somebody has to, you know, that has to be, electricity has to be generated, and that requires fuel uh, to do that, either coal or, or uh, uh, you know, other uh, natural gas, or, I mean, until we get to sort of the hydrogen part of the equation, uh, which we're not there yet, uh, you know, we still have to rely on these other uh, sources of, of energy. And so, um, so, you, you know, if you have Patagonia on one side and ExxonMobil on the other, and then like sort of in the middle is, you know, a GE or a Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan Chase. Let's yep. take the GE. Uh, well, you, you know, just, you just right. I, I, I mean, tell us I, I can assure you that, um, you know, well, at least in my study of the boardroom of GE from, say, 1980 to you know, 2020, uh, I'm less familiar with sort of what's happened lately, but I mean, they, they, are, they were not concerned with ESG issues in any uh, serious way, right? They were concerned with the issues confronting this company at this particular time, you know, uh, whether it was, you know, to do, uh, you know, M&A deals or to, to buy and sell companies or to make sure that in, in Jack's tenure, that they were number one or number two in their industries that they wanted to be in. And if not, they got out of those industries. In Jeff's tenure, it was sort of how to, you know, transform the company into a, you know, a digital technology company, which didn't particularly work, uh, and to grapple with the problems in, in the individual businesses that they were in, whether it was you know, the jet engine business, the power turbine business, GE Capital, the healthcare business, that's what they're focused on in the, in the boardroom. And yes, I mean, they're not, not focused on some aspects. You know, they are focused on governance issues. They are focused on social issues, right? How people at the company are treated. I think they care about that. And, and that people have an opportunity for advancement. I think they care about that. And I think they care about uh, retaining so let's call the best. that human capital. Right. I think, okay. of course, they care about human capital. Uh, but I think if they're, they're not sitting there thinking, you know, I've, I've, I've got to get out of the. I'll tell you what they're not doing. They're not sitting there thinking, I got to get out of the. Uh, you know, power turbine business, the generation of electricity business, because it uses fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're not thinking about I'm going to get out of the jet engine business because we haven't uh, perfected a hydrogen jet engine yet. They are focused on selling, uh, you know, power turbines and jet engines, whatever the fuel is that powers. 
Okay. And to the extent that a company in this environment, which is somewhat different, so post pandemic, yep. okay, a little bit more socially um, charged, let's call it, um, is diplomatically put, yes. No one would ever accuse me of that. Yeah. Certainly not my not my partners partner. and not my colleagues. So, but I'll take it. So I did go to diplomacy school and, and was advised to find a new career. <laughs> that. So um in in the post-pandemic environment, um if your shareholders or activists or proxy folks bringing um, a proxy proposal are suggesting that an area of concern ought to be um, ESG related or more focused on human capital. Larry, to bring you into the discussion, is that something, isn't that something that a director, an officer of the company then has an obligation as a steward to pay attention to? Or is that, you know, to, to Bill's point, should they be exclusively focused on advancing the business, on all of these things that create shareholder value? Or should we have this broader notion of shareholder value that encompasses these intangibles? Well, I think, Bill, thank you. I think Bill is exactly right uh, to point out that companies are different. And Patagonia, in particular, elected under Delaware corporation law to be a public benefit corporation. And that means it gets to opt out of the traditional purpose of a corporation to maximize the long-term value of the corporation shareholders into some other purpose. And the purpose it put into that special B Corp charter was to save the earth. And that's what they're maximizing. And they're allowed to do that. And you know, for me, I, I just think it, we don't actually need to have this debate. Anybody who wants that system can have it. Since 2012, any Delaware company who wants to prioritize anything other than the, the traditional economic can do that. Delaware law, for all other companies, continues to be a, quote, shareholder primacy state. I was at a conference in November with the former chancellor of the state who gave us, for a group of directors, gave a summary of the Delaware system. A seven minute, beautiful rendition of the history, purpose, structure, strategy, philosophy. And he ended by saying Delaware is still a shareholder primacy state. And then he had to say, and that's a good thing, which blew my mind because that's where we are. But so the purpose of a Delaware corporation is to maintain the long-term value of the corporation for the corporation and its shareholders. And that, that's the director's mantra. Now, in doing so, there's no question the director will be obligated to take to, to, to look after the interests of others. If the, if the workforce is, is, is exposed to sexual harassment or it's unsafe or it's dangerous, well, the directors better fix that or get the managers to. So you're darn right. Directors have an obligation to the employees. They may have an obligation to the planet. But the primary, North Star, is the share the long-term interest of the corporation and shareholders, and that can encompass these other things. Can the shareholders direct the directors? No. The basic structure of corporation law is the shareholders own the residual equity interest, and they elect the directors. They can also remove them, but then the directors are charged with the central governing function under fiduciary duty. So a director who just does what the shareholder says is violating her duty. Moreover, if the director puts her own personal interests and values above those of the corporation interest. She's violating her duties. So when these shareholder proposals come in, raising these super thorny issues of religious, of civic uh, uh, contention, uh, a director's got a heck of a problem on her hands. And, uh, and Larry, what, what happens when there's somebody at a regulator, like at an independent agency that suddenly, or the agency that was, you know, quasi independent that suddenly is is saying that you know companies should be focused on climate change or should be focused on human capital and all of these things. Is is that not kind of interfering and, and sort of diving into the boardroom? Yeah, and there's a there's a long standing um, 
divide, but, but sort of frictional between federal regulatory authority and state corporation law. There's been a great debate about whether we should have federal preemption of state corporation law, and um, we could have that debate now. And a lot of um, uh, people who become leaders or commissioners on regulatory agencies tend to believe that federal oversight, a unified uh, environment is, is superior. And this, the fragmented uh, atomistic approach of all the states doing different things is a bad idea. Um, but the law that we have <laughs> respects states' rights, and at the moment, at least, um, it's not the um, jurisdiction of the Securities Exchange Commission to regulate the internal affairs of a, of a corporation. And I think some of the some of the regulations, a couple of that are proposed right now, certainly come very close. Um, they, 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 these guys, they're smart guys. So they, they tried to say, look, we're only asking for disclosure. But the disclosure topics are of a governance nature. So I'm thinking about the cyber, um, cyber regulation. Security, and, cyber security risk and board oversight. Yeah, yep. Same language as in the climate disclosure, which says, tell us, disclose, if you have a director who's an expert in climate or cyber, how they got that expertise, what's it based on, how often they met, how many other people talk to them, what other information you examine. It, this very uh, delineated sort of disclosure and the proponents of that disclosure would say that's all it is and people are saying that's important to them that's all we're doing um skeptics would say that's that is <laughs> intentionally trying to embarrass people or force people into appointing directors with that specific expertise having these conversations doing these things so there's there's a clear tension between the federal oversight authority and and the and the traditional state corporation province and uh, you know, as a board, what do, what do you do about that? I, th I think you, you you do your level best to appreciate that you, you, it's up to this board to decide, do we need a cyber expert? Do we need a climate expert or an expert on any particular subject? Um, you know, GE might want an engineer. Uh, McDonald's might want a, uh, a person who's good at you know, managing large groups of people. So uh, it's, it's up to each individual board, but you're right. There is enormous pressure. And again, I, is my big concern of, of homogenization. The, 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 one of the critiques of federal regulation is it is very much one size fits all. So the implication of a disclosure like that is every board needs to have these two experts. Uh, I, I'm just less confident that that's true. So Bill, back to you. How do you, in terms of, and I'm, I'm gonna change gears a little bit. What role do you think activists play in terms of getting companies, boards to do a better job of creating shareholder value um, or not? You know, I think, uh, I think activists play a very important role. I mean, we used to call them corporate raiders. Yes. Uh, and uh, that, that was sort of exciting. Uh, now we call them activists. Um, and they're still less colorful. less colorful, but they still, you know, they just sort of swarm in, you know, we kind of know who they are, uh, you know, from my perspective as a, as a journalist, a writer, uh, about this, they certainly shake things up, um, and they end up, I mean, whether it's GE or Disney or Salesforce or, you know, they, they you know, or AT&T, uh, you know, they, you know, they used to just, you know, when they were corporate raiders go after sort of smaller companies and then uh, corporate raiders sort of evolved into, uh, you know, LBO firms that sort of took big companies private and, you know, now we call them, uh, uh, you know, activists and uh, they have clearly have a very important role to play in my judgment. Uh, and uh, sometimes they're effective and sometimes they capitulate and sometimes they sort of achieve their goals early and sometimes they abandon, you know, they're very sort of unpredictable. They get a lot of attention, uh, which gives them additional power. They have an ability to uh, get on, uh, you know, CNBC or Bloomberg, you know, Fox Business and, and talk their book and, and put a lot of pressure on boards and management. And, you know, the, the easiest thing, frankly, is to find a way to make them go away. If, if I were CEO, I would, um, you know, not try to fight them. I know, you know, Bob Iger, uh, uh, you know, decided he was going to, I think, uh, apparently, uh, fight Nelson Peltz. And then 
uh, but basically capitulated to everything that Nelson wanted. And then Nelson said, okay, he was going to go away. So um, the, the short answer is they're very important and I'm glad they're there doing their job. Uh, and sometimes it involves ESG issues, but mostly it just involves money issues because that's what they really care about is getting, you know, buying stock, uh, starting their agitation, starting their campaign. Uh, and then once the stock hits various thresholds that they have in their mind for what, you know, for their returns, they generally get the heck out and move on to something else. So we have just a few minutes left. Um, obviously, we've all had some eventful uh, weeks and um, we have you. So we might as well ask, about um, failures in corporate governance or risk or risk monitoring in that, that you've observed just generally in um, your writing or, and please don't use names. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Otherwise I, we'll have a heart yeah, attack. I would say so, we're, we're, we're at a point, we're notable, an epidemic. Yes, okay. I think it's an epidemic of... Um, do, 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 and I don't think it's the directors. The directors get blamed, and they deserve some of the blame. But I think we're in an epidemic of uh, director failure to do their job. And I won't name names, but um, you know, it wouldn't be hard to figure out who I might be talking about. But uh, I think part of the problem is, and uh, Larry, I'd be interested in what you th think. Obviously, is what um, you know. First of all, to get asked to be on a corporate board is um, uh, often considered an honor. Okay, so that's number one. So if you're like a, uh, either a CEO or a professor or you know an academic, whatever it is, to to get asked to be on a corporate board is not only uh, prestigious, an honor. Uh, it, it pays pretty damn well, all things considered. Uh, you know, you're not going to get. You know, you're not you're not going to get Elon Musk rich, but you you know for what you're doing, you're going to get well compensated. And so that, that so that's sort of step one that happens. Then step two is you know, uh, well, there's also this dynamic on the board itself that you have to get used to as a new director. And and you know, I I find this on even on uh, nonprofit boards. You know, how do you begin to participate? When do you participate? You know, there's a pecking order. There are clearly people who've been around longer who, you know, seem to have, you know, renegades in any social setting aren't necessarily appreciated. And then, and then the third aspect of this is essentially the CEO, uh, you know, you know, controls the agenda for these board meetings. Like in one of the books I wrote, no, I can say this one because this company is gone and it's okay. But in in, in the collapse of uh, Bear Stearns, a uh, book that I wrote. Um, you know, Jimmy Kane, may he rest in peace, uh, you know, controlled the agenda of, of those board meetings. And so I, you know, did all this reporting. I wrote what sort of happened. And I had board members call me up after the book came out and said, you know, I had no idea that this was going on. I was in the board room, you know, and I'd see like on the agenda, mortgage, our, you know, mortgage backed securities division. But we'd like, never get to it you know there'd be uh, all this stuff going on obviously not necessarily obfuscating, but just taking up time you know and at the end of four hours everybody's kind of exhausted it's time for cigars and brandy and steak you know the fun part that's why i'm on the board to also have fun and so we don't get to the problems in the mortgage-backed security uh tomorrow so i have you know uh people who were cfos and ceos of big companies call me up and say I had no idea this was going on. Uh, I can't believe this was going on when I was on the board and I didn't know about it. You know, Jimmy didn't really get into it with us. And what, what are we supposed to do? I mean, so there's obvious impediments to doing a really good job as a director. You know, uh, you, you don't want to piss anybody off. You obviously don't know the business as well as the management. You know, you, you're there, you know, whatever, four, six, eight times a year. And, you know, part of it is this social thing. You get, you know, brought to the, you know, turbine power plant in Greenville, South Carolina. And then you go to this dinner at some fancy, 
you know, uh, in or a lead club, uh, you know, down there. They can only get in if you're on the GE. Well, you're not going to mess with, you know, you're just not going to mess with that. I mean, and then, of course, not to, you know, mention any names, but then you run across like a Ken Langone. Right, who who Jack asked to be on the GE board, and then Jeff fired from the GE board. I mean, and he's like incredibly outspoken, right? And he'll he'll says it, tells it, you know, speaks his mind. And I come along, and he's more than happy to go through it all with me, and it's fabulous, and it makes for great journalism. And so, uh, you know, and I'm just thankful for people like that who tell like it is. But he's by far the exception to the rule. So, Larry, I'm going to give you the the last few words and the last thoughts on to, to wrap everything up well i'll just on a footnote on that topic i agree with everything you said you're exactly right i, I, I mean i think i've been on several boards i've been an activist nominee and several i've seen a lot of this stuff up close and i agree the most important job any board has by far is picking the ceo because then that guy that guy has all the power it's it's very difficult to be Kane. even ken lango has a hard time being Ken Langone. So it, that, that's 95% of the job. And if you get that right, you can eat the steak and, and go to the turbine. It's, it's just, you're, you're going to have uh, ethical stewardship and leadership and, and, and candor. And, and there, there are CEOs who are like that. Get it wrong and it's going to be miserable. So it's the most, it's the most important, most important um, job. And I do think um, uh, we can learn a lot from Bill's books. We can learn a, a lot from the pathologies. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't like seeing them, but we 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 can get lessons. Uh, you can learn a lot from Bill's uh, book on GE. I think that was a very bizarre company. Uh, you, know, you had this uh, uh, iconic CEO with these bold, big ideas. A lot of. Uh, he was a progenitor CEO, so everyone wanted, wanted to work with him and genuflect to him. It was a crazy, so it's beautiful. And he, the, the chapter on accounting, uh, earning smoothing, Jack was famous for that. That's a great chapter in, in, in Bill's book. But you can you can learn a lot from these from these pathologies. Um, I to me, the, the biggest takeaway from this rise and fall is that or rise and stall because it, it, there's enormous enormous power is that we, we, we need to pay attention to first principles. Uh, and, and, and that means what is the purpose of a corporation? You know, start there and, and don't, you know, and, and I, I don't mean to be prescriptive because it should be an open debate, but I think if you study it carefully, you realize it's not designed to be a political institution. <laughs> it's not a democracy. It's not a place to deliberate the, the value systems. Uh, and if, if, but Times Square is, <laughs> the Agora is, right? The um, Zoom is. Um, and I think we need to return to some of some of those basics. And, um, you know, I think uh, conversations like this help. And I'm very, very grateful for everybody uh, joining in, Bill, especially for, for coming yeah. by. So. Yeah, I completely agree with what Larry said. Not, not that I wouldn't, if, if I felt differently, I would certainly feel free to disagree. But I think that. Yes, we know that. That's, that's uh, you know, that's absolutely right. And I think. The, just one other thought is I think the, the market plays a big role in all of this is, you know, as I like to say the you know, the stone age didn't end because we ran out of stones. Right. I mean, we, 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 we figured something else out that was better. I think we're in the process of figuring out some the market, uh, you know, and, and what is the market? The market is all these companies and people working to, you know, make a buck or make a living and to make, you know, truly to try to make the world better, right? And so uh, I think, you know, we're in the process, we're in that, we're in this area now where we're slowly, you know, ending the, or, or slowing down the fossil fuel age and getting into the, a different age. And that's going to happen. Uh, and we're not going to run out of fossil fuels. Uh, before that happens. That's going to happen before we run out of fossil fuels, just like the Stone Age ended before we ran out of stones. And, uh, you know, that, that's, what's, that's what's got to happen here, and that is happening. It's even probably even happening faster than we thought it would be possible to happen. You know, Mercedes-Benz has said, you know, every car that they sell will be electric by 2025. You know, GE is developing... You know, hydrogen uh, engines for for the jets, and uh, you know, you know, fission or fusion or whatever it is, you know, may or may not be real this time. I mean, so things are happening that 
uh, are going to, I think, begin to, you know, maybe not in my lifetime, but moot out some of these issues that have given rise to, you know, ESG overlay. And one final thought that just cracks me up is that when the, the Republicans in Congress talk about uh, Silicon Valley Bank being a woke bank, and that's why it went down the tubes. I mean, that is beyond ridiculous. There are about a hundred reasons why it went down the tubes, but being woke okay, is not one of them. Other okay. okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.